We'll talk about a speedy start. Um, you will also, I hope, have received on your chair some notice of a room change for this afternoon's session. So, recreating landscapes is now in room G306 downstairs, and the ethnicity and religious practices among the Sami North people is in the lecture theatre upstairs, which I hope is this room. Okay, welcome to this panel on Viking Age 2, Law, Mythology and the Landscape. Initially, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michelle <coughs> Hayes Smith from the Hafton River Museum at Brown University. Um, what we're going to do is have questions directly after each paper. Okay, so I have your questions already. And I welcome Michelle, who's going to talk about Norse, North Atlantic textiles and textile production a reflection of adaptive strategies in unique island environments. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. And good morning. Um, I wanted to start out first of all by thanking you all for being here today, but also particularly thanking the organizers uh, for having accepted my paper. I'm to be here. <laughs> um, what I'll be doing today is I am going to be discussing the textile traditions. I have to specify these are archaeological textile collections from three regions in the North Atlantic that were colonized by the Norse. So the um, Iceland, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and Greenland. And I just put these dates up just to show you when, in case you didn't know, when these places were settled, and basically um, to take note also that the Greenland, the Norse Greenland colony, is no longer in case you didn't know. Now, the research that I am presenting today is based on two research projects that have been going on for about six years now that I've been doing on North Atlantic textiles. The first one, uh, looking at Icelandic textiles, and the one that I'm currently involved with is, is basically sort of contextualizing this Icelandic material into a greater North Atlantic perspective, so looking at other areas in the North Atlantic to see how the textile traditions are similar or dissimilar. <coughs> Another thing to point out, I am working on material that covers a very long time period, a thousand years of so the settlement, roughly the 9th century to the 19th century. And you might think, oh my god, this is such a huge amount of time. But this is a really good way to be able to actually track patterns and changes in weaving traditions in this area. This research has been funded um, by the National Science Foundation of uh, the United States. Now, um, <coughs> the Atlantic textiles, you might think, oh, um, they're like the Scandinavian textiles, and they are. But they do form actually a unified and somewhat different um, group of uh, artifacts, even though the techniques, tools, and a lot of the technology came from the Scandinavian homeland. There are some regional adjustment, adjustments that you see in the North Atlantic material, um, and some influences actually from the British Isles as well, which I'm not going to be able to get into today because that's a whole other paper. Um, what I'd like to do today is to try and demonstrate that each region started out with comparable weaving traditions but eventually they adapted um, their own uh, traditions and basically catering either to their local needs or uh, things that affected their lifestyle, such as isolation, environmental hardship, or the influences of the Little Ice Age, for example, and um, international trade. One thing to bear in mind with textiles is that textile work was done by women. In fact, my research has focused a lot on issues of gender and women. And in the North Atlantic, we often find that women are absent from the archaeological record. Um, but if you actually turn to the objects and the artifacts that women produce, you can actually gain access to their lives, their concerns, decision making, etc. In Iceland, in the North Atlantic, men did not engage in textile production. Um, and this is apparent not only in the archaeological data, but also in the saga literature. One thing I have to stress before I start any further on textiles is that in the North Atlantic, there are no urban centers, so we are not talking about a textile tradition that is based in guilds or based in towns. This is done on individual farms um, across the area. Now, um, so the archaeological textiles um, in Scandinavia are very well researched. Um, it's not entirely, or was not entirely the case in the North Atlantic when I started. Um, there is something, or quite a bit, known about the Greenlandic material thanks to the monograph that was produced by Elsa Ostergaard in 2004 called Woven into the Earth. In Iceland, um, they were the focus, not the archaeological textiles, but they were the focus of the late Elsa Gudjonsson, who was actually researched more issues of the national costume. Oops, sorry, we seem to have jumped. 
like that. Um, she was more interested in ethnographic material, tapestries, finer items of clothing or finer items of textiles, rather than looking at the scrappy little brown rags that come out of the middens of Norse farms, <laughs> of which there are a lot. Um, some of the material was looked at by Marta Hoffman, and Penelope Walton Rogers also looked at the material from the Reykholt farm. Now, one of the things about the preservation, and this is particularly true for Iceland, the textile collections are huge. Um, and one of the reasons for this is obviously uh, preservation. It's the sort of environmental conditions. Normally, textiles do not preserve on archaeological sites or very little. Um, it's partly to do with the permafrost, but in Iceland, the way you find them is often interred between blocks of turf. So when they're thrown out in, as garbage, so they're discarded, and they are encased between these blocks of turf, which creates a very acidic um, environment, which textiles love and bones not so much. So you end up with these big pieces that come out, which is um, quite fun. So if we look at the um, numbers in the collections at the moment, per region, you can see that Iceland really is way more substantial than the other areas. Partially, of course, this has to do with preservation. So between, and these are rough estimates, between 5,000 and 10,000. Greenland, 736, probably a few more than that. Faroe Islands, there wasn't much known about it until I got there, and I've managed to find about 142, but I'm not completely done. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the tools, except to say that the warp-weighted loom was used across the area until the early 1700s, um, and the drop spindle or high top whirl when you spin up, um, uh, up your leg. And of course, the sheep seems to want to jump on its own. The sheep, which is the North Atlantic variety. All right, now we're next. <laughs> So in Iceland, textile production was one of the more important household activities of Icelanders in the medieval period. Like I said before, produced entirely by women, they rapidly gained importance, becoming a significant trade commodity exported to Norway in the early medieval period, with growing markets expanding first to the British Isles and then to Northern Europe. Now, um, in Iceland, cloth in the early medieval period became the basis of the economic system, and used as a type of currency with an equivalent value um, in the weight of silver or based on the weight of silver. And they used textiles to pay taxes, tithes, debts, fines. And in fact, um, the medieval uh, literary sources and law codes, such as Graugas, Jalmsida, Jonsbok, Guelok, all suggest that there were very strict legal guidelines that were implemented that were regulating the size, the length, and the quality of this currency. So I'm just going to put this up. This just these are some snippets, basically, from these sources, um, you know, suggesting that this was, in fact, a type of currency. But, but beyond its use as currency, it also had many utilitarian functions. So cloth had many different lives, starting out as currency, but it also was often cut up and then turned into clothing, sails, tents, household implements, blankets, pillows, saddles, etc., bags. Um, the term of the currency, and this is if you pay attention to the cloth in the background, um, this is what is known as vavmal, and vavmal comes from two Norse words, vav, meaning stuff or cloth, and mal, to measure, which means basically vavmal should mean cloth measured to standard. And it's a term that's used very loosely, um, oh, we've got vavmal, anything brown is like vavmal, but really vavmal is money, okay, and it is the money, and in, in physically what it looks like, it is a two to two twill, it's Z to S spun, and it has a thread count range between four and 14 warp threads per centimeter. Now, this brings me, of course, to the different weave types in Iceland, and in fact, um, in the medieval period, Vavmal pretty much outnumbers everything, the two to two twill. You also find some tabby weaves, which is worth actually less, but isn't actually used as a currency. Um, and it's interesting because when you're looking at the Viking Age material, you do also find a fair amount of two to two twills. But you find, when you look at these, and this is what you get when you look at a big perspective like that, is that you find, in fact, that the Viking Age material is more diverse. I think I have to stop waving this around. <laughs> is slightly more diverse types of weaves, um, more, uh, more color in the material, smaller collections. And then when you get into the medieval period, it goes down to brown brown rags, which I'm not saying that they're all brown because, of course, often if you run dye analysis, you find that they are other colors as well. But you do find a real homogeneity in the medieval material um, with a far less diversity in types of weaves that you um, actually see. 
So one thing that I do is that I do, um, I use, I do do thread counts, which of course everybody's like, oh my god, it's so boring doing thread counts, and it's not fun, but they are actually, like when you buy a pair of sheets, you can look at your thread counts on the sheet, and it tells you how fine your textile is. And actually, thread counts are really useful devices to help you figure out how fine or how coarse your textiles are, but they're also great data points for tracking changes in textile production strategies, assemblage of the variability, cloth standardization, industrialization, and more. And so, when you begin to look at the medieval material, and this is what struck me, and you start to look at medieval sites, suddenly you find that these two to two twills are coming at you like crazy, and they're all the same. They are all woven the same, they all have the same finish, and it is like a massive explosion of two to two twills. In fact, it really gets kind of boring because every single site has the same thing with a similar range of thread counts. Now what this produces if you start plotting it on a graph, you start to find that things are actually really, really tight and very um, tightly uh, clustered. Um, and what in fact you're seeing is that you were seeing this standardization, extreme standardization in production. And you find that you do have this range roughly between about 5 to about 14 warp threads per centimeters. These are each one are different um, medieval sites. And um, what you find is also you find that some are a bit more popular than others. And in the later medieval period, you actually find that there were different grades of this stuff, and so some of it was not very good. The four warp, uh, four warp threads per centimeter was the pakavadma, or the rougher <coughs> stuff. And you had some very fine stuff, or you had the galvanite, <coughs> which is actually the currency. So what's happening in Iceland, um, when you look at this material, and you, you start contrasting it also with the early modern material, or with the Viking material, is that you find really that cloth had become a lot more than just the basic material for producing other objects, and had become instead a standardized legal unit of currency produced on a quasi-industrial scale within Iceland. It's also traded overseas. Every medieval site that you come across will have a huge amount of these two to two twills, or the Valma. Now why is this? Why did they do this? Well, one of the explanations is that at the end of the Viking Age, the silver supplies were dwindling in Iceland, and before that, their economy was based on a silver and on the weight of silver. And what they did is that they basically took what they have. They have fish, they have wool, so the wool becomes currency. Now, this was something also that they had learned in Norway. And in fact, if you go into Western Norway and you look at the Gullething Law, you will see that they do mention Vagmal as well, and they do mention very, very similar weights and values for it, as you find in Graugas. Well, it turns out that actually the Gullething Law was the model for um, Graugas. And so they basically, in Iceland, they took what was mentioned in Norway, and they just like, it booms, and this becomes their form of currency. Greenland, I didn't even have to press the button. So, by the last um, decades of the 10th century, when the Icelanders sailed to Greenland to settle, they brought with them, obviously, this important textile tradition, but there is no evidence that they used it as currency in Greenland at all. In fact, one of the more interesting factors with, with Greenland is that at some point in time around the 14th century, you start to see a shift in how they are making this cloth. So you find the same weave types, the same, exactly the same kind of cloth until about that point. And then they begin to add, in their textiles, more weft yarns. So the warps are the vertical ones and the wefts are the horizontal ones. As a rule of thumb, Norse textiles tend to be slightly more warp dominant. And in the 14th century in Greenland, they start to change. So this is from the, these are both from the same site earlier, later. And in the later periods, they begin to add more weft. So they begin really packing them in like crazy. Now, I'm not a person who identified this. In fact, this was observed by Elsa Ustegar. And she attributed the weft dominant cloth um, to the later sequence, and basically that women were looking to make warmer clothing in the face of increasingly harsh winters. And it is an effective strategy in garment construction. And she felt, that actually, that the use in Norse, um, they used to separate the two on the sheet. They would separate the outer hair from the inner hair and use the outer hairs as warp yarns and the inner hairs <coughs> as the weft, which was more fluffy. So she felt that, in fact, if they used more of the under wool and beat it more closely to the loom, they were, in fact, creating a more firm and warm product. She never identified a specific date for when this occurred. Um, and so um, 
goodness, it's already there. It's amazing. I think I have to actually go back one more. Here we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> In 2013, I had the chance actually to work with uh, Conrad Smirovsky from Hunter College, and he had been working in the Igaliku Fjord in, in Greenland, in the eastern settlement at a place called Tatsipitakele, at the site of E172. And he was excavating in Midden, and so he, they handed me the textiles, and I was actually lucky because, thankfully, they had quite a good control of the chronological sequence, so we were actually able to look at when this behavior had occurred. So here is his eight Harris matrix, and what I found was that in fact, in his phase one, which is 1,000 to 1,100, the textiles are exactly like the Icelandic textiles, warp, more warp dominant. And then towards the end of phase one, I started to see that the textiles were actually of equal, sort of what we call balance, so equal warps, equal wefts, almost as if there was a kind of an experimental <coughs> phase going on, and you start to see this happening here. And this continues as equal sort of thread count, sometimes one more weft. Um, during, <laughs> during his phase two, all right, I won't touch it. Um, so basically around 1200, towards the end of his phase two, you start to see the appearance and the emergence of this weft on dominant cloth, which continues right into his phase three. So. All right, so if, again, if you plot this on a graph, and you hear, you see here, the gray boxes are his um, phase two, and towards the end of his phase two, you start to see here are the weft dominant. And in gray, light gray, I put heriousness, which is a late north site where all the textiles are um, weft dominant. Hang on, here we go. And I superimpose that on top of the Icelandic medieval material, so you can sort of see um, the differences that are going on. All right, where was I now? Okay, so then I, what I did is that I took a couple of samples of cloth from the phase two and the late phase two to see when did this phenomena actually take place. I sent these off for AMS dating to beta analytic laboratories in Miami, and the results that came back were between 1308 and 1362, which is actually well within the range of the first cold transition during the Little Ice Age. And so then what I did is that I went to the climate data and said, okay, well, what's going on? What are the climatologists saying about this? And this is an article by Mann et al. And if you look at the northern hemisphere mean, you start to see the drops in temperatures correlate exactly with when they are starting to make weft dominant cloth. So if you look at this little green box here, these are roughly the dates. And they correlate with the first real drop in temperature. So it really seems to be something that they are doing. In fact, she was right in that they are really trying to keep warm. So generally, obviously our discussions of climate change are relatively abstract, employing proxy measures rather than evidence of human suffering or agency. And this type of behavior is so rare in the archaeological record, and particularly manifested in material culture like this. And it brings to mind the decisions and decision-making processes that women had to make when they changed the way they produced cloth. When the temperatures dropped, what did they do? Well, they adjusted their weaving to this. And it's interesting because they don't actually change the appearance of the cloth too much. They don't affect its weight. Um, it's a bit more dense. And it's not, they don't have any trouble either working with it or sewing with it. So it's not completely changed. They're still within, basically, um, what they understand as cloth. So now I'm going to jump to the Faroe Islands, the next place. Now, when I go to the Faroe Islands, very little was known about archaeological textiles that were like, we don't know what kind of textiles we have, and we start going through the collections. And actually, in a week, we were able to identify 142 items of cloth from the entire period, almost nothing from the Viking Age, maybe one piece, um, and about 44, which I have displayed right here, from the medieval period. Now, the problem with, obviously, the Faroese material, there wasn't as much, conditions are different, um, so it's very difficult to sort of figure out if there are any patterns that you can see in the same way as you see in Iceland or you see in Greenland, because the sample is, is actually really too small for that. But there was one thing that really struck me, was that you need particular uh, conditions for the preservation of wool or textiles, and yet we do have a lot of spinning, spinner's waste, uh, raw wool, and scrappy bits of uh, cordage and whatnot uh, made of wool, and very little textiles. And so the question is, where are the textiles? So discussing with uh, Simon Arge, the uh, 
a head archaeologist there, he was thinking, you know, this has got to be because the material was traded somewhere else, which is a possibility, of course. So looking into this whole theory of trade in textiles. Now, in Iceland, we know that textiles figured as an important commodity in international <coughs> trade prior to the 14th century. And some scholars, actually, such as Bruce Gelsinger, believe that in the 10th century Norway, that um, they were uh, keen trading partners with Iceland, um, trading for textiles and other supplies, of wood, grain, etc. Um, but they were really interested in acquiring woolen cloth as well. He felt that, in fact, um, they, they didn't have enough woolen cloth in Norway, according to him, and so they were supplementing it with North Atlantic um, or Icelandic wool. Um, also, bear in mind that the Icelandic wool was quite cheap as well. In 1022, the two countries had established their first reciprocal commercial agreement. But Norway also forged ties with England to acquire additional supplies to satisfy both Norwegian and Icelandic markets. So according to the same author, the need for cheap, inexpensive, considerably rough cloth also grew in England, because in England there was very fine wool, wool and cloth being produced, but it was also being shipped and exported elsewhere, and so there was a lack of sort of cheap stuff to clothe the urban poor. So according to his interpretation, Vadmal was used in, uh, by the urban poor in Europe, and he supported this partially by medieval documentary data for the competitive prices in Icelandic Vadmal, but also using post-medieval sources such as the Brothers Grimm, where the term Vadmal is defined as a type of cloth used by the lower classes and the paupers in Germany. So it does as a term, Vadmal, Woodmal. <coughs> Woodmal shows up around Europe as being this cheap, crappy, itchy cloth. <laughs> basically. And the Hanseatic League also, who made their way to, to uh, Norway during the 13th century, um, it's thought that the Vagmal that they obtained in Norway, close the poor, was also probably North Atlantic or Icelandic, at any rate. Now, in September, I went to Bergen, and I went to the Bergen Museum to have a look at their collections as sort of a little pilot project to kind of assess the nature of these collections. They have a collection of about 3,000 to 4,000 items of cloth, and I sampled about 338 uh, pieces. Uh, this is obviously doing a visual assessment at this point because you know, I would have needed obviously more time. And I'm actually collaborating with uh, Gita Hansen right now, and we're going to be uh, combining an analysis in, sorry, the back one, <laughs> an analysis um, of the textiles uh, along with doing some strontium analysis, which will help identify the provenance of where this material came. But from my first assessment, I would say that about 50% of the cloth in the Brigham collections are probably Icelandic or North Atlantic. Um, and it's possible, actually, that, in fact, the Faroese material ended up there as well. Now, I also was reading more recently that apparently in Shetland, a lot of cloth was exported towards Norway as well. And like Iceland, textiles were used as currency up until about the 1600s, used to pay taxes to landowners, governors, etc according to some archival sources. Textiles were also produced for trade, of which large amounts were being shipped to Norway. So it's possible that, in fact, a lot of our North Atlantic cloth that you're not seeing necessarily, Shetland, um, the Faroe Islands, was actually has ended up in the Norwegian collection. So it's important, I think, at this point to go and, and look towards that area, and possibly even material from Orkney as well, maybe a place where they were sending stuff as well. So basically, to sort of wrap this all up, we have three situations, all three coming from a similar textile tradition. Each one kind of evolved into its own thing. In Iceland, they took one type of cloth and just exploded it. Um, they're produced almost in an industrial fashion on every farm across Iceland. The cloth is highly standardized and is also described and supported by the, the medieval uh, law codes and, and law books. <laughs> Probably a lack of resources um, and the lack of silver in this barter economy system prompted people to use their local resources, wool and fish, obviously, in both local and international trade. Within Iceland, it was cloth, it was currency. And you see this as really kind of a, an explosion that happens. In Greenland, there's no evidence for this currency. There's no evidence of standardization in the same way. You also find uh, mixtures of other fibers sometimes um, incorporated with the cloth, almost like they're trying to stretch their resources as well. Let's keep going back here. Um, 
so you really, and you also see the effects of the Little Ice Age through this weft dominant cloth that you see in, in Greenland. And in the Faroe Islands, <coughs> there's more textile debris and spinners waste raw wool than there are actual textiles. Insufficient data to support a theory of currency going on there. Where are the textiles? And it could be that in fact there was a lot of trade going on and a lot of it was um, being produced for export and that what they needed in uh, the pharaohs was probably not a huge amount. And I think future research, we will look at what is in Bergen. So the differences in textile production already noted in Iceland and, Iceland and Greenland may show up in some European collections and could be used as distinct markers or signatures combined with other analyses to shed more light on the question of trade and movement of cloth in this northern area. But taken individually, each one of these regions is suggesting unique adaptive strategies reflected in material culture. All stemming from common textile traditions, they evolved into their own idiosyncratic way based on the hardship or environmental conditions people found themselves in. And more importantly, though, it also offers a glimpse into the world of women. So frequently absent from the archaeological record, the decisions they took as weavers and deliberately trying to survive in this harsh North Atlantic milieu. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Such a fascinating and comprehensive paper. It's wonderful. I'm sure there was, we have some time, yes, for questions. So, yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation, Michelle. I have a little question. You mentioned that in the Icelandic record, the earlier uh, Badmau is more colorful and more varied, and later it becomes obviously a commodity. Right. Do you think the first material might be, the, var the variation in the earlier material might be related to the fact it circulated through other channels than trade, like its gifts or central redistribution or oh, something like that? Oh, it's totally possible. And it, the other thing, I've, I've actually, in the Viking Age material, you also find a lot more diverse weaves. So you find basket weaves, pile weaving, you yeah. find tablet woven bounds. All of that seems to kind of dwindle out by the medieval period. A lot of the material also seems to be have been produced in Norway. And a lot of it is actually, um, it's, it comes from burial contexts, and in fact, the textiles are spun differently, and they are slightly different. And and what you're obviously seeing in the medieval period is also material coming out of Nidus, so it's not the same. Yes. Uh, thanks for that, Michelle. That was really, really very interesting. Um, just just as uh, um, to flag up, really, um, do you have any um, silks that you've seen in in your assembly, Viking um, Age assemblages? No, not in the later period, the early modern, yes, a lot. Yeah, but in the Viking Age. No, no. Because one of the things that's, that's really changing um, in the uh, new discoveries in Scotland, in men of Scotland, is that um, we've got a, a fantastic new hoard from Galloway, which, yeah. is, which is absolutely packed with, with, with goods, but also silks, and okay. things are wrapped individually in silks. But the, the pot itself, which is a beautiful um, uh, Carolingian pot, mm -hmm. um, is wrapped in a, a really quite coarse cloth. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, you know, described it as a sock because I didn't know whether it was null bending. I don't do textiles, as mm -hmm. you know, um, but I just think that um, I think Penny's looking at that, and okay. I think that might be quite an interesting, interesting thing because yeah. that's a route that's coming in through the Danelaw right, from, right. from Europe, and there may well be yeah. uh, something that's comparable to what you're looking at there. Right the now, in law. terms of the Viking material, half of it is mineralized, yes. so it's often difficult to tell if you're dealing with silk or not. Um, mm. So it's possible that some of it was and that we just don't know. In terms of actual textiles themselves, I haven't seen any silk at this point. So, and not very much linen, and I'm sure there was a lot more linen as well, and a lot more trade in linen, but this is, again, you know, these are textiles that don't preserve as well as wool here. So we often get, a kind of, obviously you get a somewhat skewed perception of the, of the situation. I can't think of time for one more question, I think. Okay, thank you for uh, your presentation. I'd like to ask you about uh, their uh, these textiles are only uh, plain stuff, or they have some political, religious, or cultural symbols, motifs on their uh, surface? These ones are very plain. Only plain. Very plain. That, that there is a whole category of textiles that do have um, embroideries and that were often in churches and preserved by the churches <coughs> that do have more sort of symbols of, you know, um, obviously religious symbols and whatnot. And, um, but it's more, it's, the thing is that this is money, okay? So this is it's basically, I guess, how much how much money do you have, maybe how many textiles you have. And the interesting thing in Iceland is that the money is made by women. Men legally regulated, but women are making money. <laughs> so, that's a cool thing to think about. <laughs> and on that point, we'll thank you. My great pleasure now 